Hello, I'm Tony Millward and this is the Rockface Podcast. This week I was kindly invited to the home of musician Len Surtees, where we talked about his time with prog jazz rock band Ben, his 10-year tenure with the Nashville Teens, and the recording of the now legendary Case of the Blues album with Peter Green's Katmandu. If you want to hear about all this and more, keep listening as I talk to Len Surtees on the Rockface Podcast. So Len, thank yes. you very much for agreeing to do this. Thanks for coming along, Tony. It's a pleasure. Good to see you again. Um, I was just wondering, um, you've been a professional musician for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what inspired you to uh, take the musical path in the first place? I used to go to the youth club and there was a, a little group on playing uh, Buddy Holly songs. And I was quite impressed with that. And we also used to take our singles in and play them. And there was a lot of Chuck Berry. And we used to go in and... Um, so that, that led on to going to proper gigs. Right. And the first gig I went to, and being a bit naive, I got there a little bit early. And I was confronted with uh, Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce. Wow. Uh, and Graham Bond humping this Hammond up the sluts <laughs> and stairs, <laughs> effing and blinding. And, that, and I was so impressed especially with Jack Bruce with the six string bass and the harp. He used to play yeah. some harp as well and sing. And Graham Bond was just awesome. Um, and they had the sax player as well, Dick Hextall Smith. Right. That, that started me off really. And then uh, this was when we still lived in Richmond, Twickenham. It must've been quite a gig, quite a memorable gig. Yeah. It was a great impression. I was, I was, I was very impressed impressed and then uh little richard i went to see little richard okay at the kingston odeon when it was that sort of uh, when they used to do cinema yeah gigs and it was a sit down thing at the cinema because he, he was so different from anything he was else just a fantastic before, wasn't he really fantastic show yeah i mean i bet people couldn't believe their eyes or ears when i couldn't no I couldn't, I couldn't and um and then it must have been shortly after that we moved to camberley yeah I met up with classmate Dave Sheen. Uh, so I took a bit of the West London scene with me. Yeah. And we started a, a band at school. I was playing guitar then. I think the first thing we played was Shaking All Over at the school concert. Yeah. And the headmaster was totally shocked. <laughs> and uh, we did get expelled. <laughs> Not immediately, but... <laughs> On the strength uh, of that, oh my maybe God. Maybe not just that. That, that, that but, uh, <laughs> evil rock music, the devil's music. <laughs> yes, exactly. It was the grammar, Camberley Grammar School, so it was a yeah. bit strict. Um, and Dave, we started going to a lot of gigs. The Who, Spencer Davis, Screaming Lord Such, um, the Yardbirds, and, and, the, and Cream a bit later when Cream were, were yeah. in full tilt. All these amazing bands. And then... Um, it's difficult to remember the sequence, sequence of events, but Dave saw an, an ad in the Melody Maker, uh, Graham Bond needed a drummer. Right. And he went for the audition and, um, Graham said, well, I've got a drummer already. I've got a drummer, but Dave played tablas when that, when that was all in the tablas. Okay. Yeah. He was great with it as well. Yeah. Great at it. And Graham said... You can play bass and tablas on a, in a spot, you know. Yeah. So Graham took him down to Charing Cross Road into a music shop and just just said to Dave, "Just pick out the bass you want." And Dave, he played a bit of guitar and he'd made a he made a guitar and played it. But he just took it on straight away and played bass with the Graham Bond's Amazing. initiation. It was called. Yeah, I remember um, Gary your bandmate Gary Roberts yeah. saying a similar thing happened to him with Denny Lane That's when right. Denny asked him to play on his album yeah and, he, and Denny just took him to his music shop and yes. uh, basically that's, pick a bass yeah that's a very similar story yeah yeah got it if only it was that easy now <laughs> Gary Gary and I and Gary Nuttall went down to see Denny playing in Brighton right and one thing led to another <laughs> and we all went on a bit of a bar crawler after and we all ended up here 
Uh, I can remember that quite well. It was mental. Oh. They really stayed the night and all the rest of it. Yeah. Unbelievable. So when, when you say here, if I could just repeat what you told me when I when I got here before I started recording. Yeah. Your neighbour used to be. It was Ringo. Ringo. Yeah. Yeah. And he inherited the house or bought the house from somebody else people might know. He, he took it from John, yeah, John Lennon. Amazing. I know. Yeah. So you, you said that you were di your uh, early morning sleep was disturbed by noises from your neighbours. I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, I think the first morning we wake up, I could hear this drumming, <laughs> this drumming <laughs> going on, and it was Zach. Zach Starkey. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, who who came on to join uh, you and Gary Roberts in Spin Out UK for a it while? It wasn't me at that time. The original lineup was Zach playing guitar. Right. It was Bernard Smiley, Smiley Bernard on drums. Yeah, from the Alarm. Um, Gary Nuttall playing guitar. So it was a twin guitar lineup with Gary playing bass and and vocals, and Gary Gary Nuttall used to sing as well. Yeah. Um, and they used to play down at the Red Line and next door here at the Cannon. I got to play with Zach in the Cannon a couple of times as well. Just jamming, really. Yeah. Ringo would come in and I realised what a pain it was being famous. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, yeah. not, I don't want to be, I don't want that. Yeah, I bet he used to get hassled all the time for autographs and, well, they didn't do selfies in those days, but no, maybe the old no. photograph as well. No, it was a pain, yeah. Yeah, but I'm, I'm sure he enjoyed some of it as well. And we used to play there, and we never told anybody, and it still got jam packed. And wow. in the summer, the whole forecourt was full just of word people, of mouth. Just word of mouth. Yeah, it, that's what it was all about in those days. When go the on. Stones played at Hyde Park, yeah, it was all word of mouth. <laughs> Everyone went. Um, there must have been about a quarter of a million people there. God, yeah, and you were there, I take yeah, it. Yeah, I well. was. Yeah, going back to Dave Sheen, uh, the next thing I know. He sent us tickets to go and see them at the Albert Hall. And um, he had a spot where he played tablas. And you could have heard a pin drop, honestly. And he, it was just like he was playing at home in his bedroom, put talcum powder on his hands and cool as a cucumber. <laughs> Started doing this tiki tiki ta you know, it, it was brilliant. This was with Graham Bond's Graham Bond, band. Yeah, yeah, Graham Bond's initiation. Right. And then Graham got arrested and put in prison for a couple of weeks and then he was never the same again um what was he arrested for debt some sort of debt oh really he, went, he, he shot off to america yeah grand bond organization he uh, and he was in america for years and then he came back and started grand bonds initiation and uh he was never the same again and uh, he, he jumped in, he, he committed suicide oh no jumped in front of a train um I did get to play with him. He, um, mm. We got into, we formed the Ben group after that. Yeah. And he was passing by. He dropped in. We were playing in Bristol at the old, gran old granary, uh, Acker Bilk's place. Right. And he got up and played with us. I'm really, I was uh, quite thrilled, yeah, yeah, to play with him. He's playing alto sax. Uh-huh. Um, so it was nice to get to play with him. Yeah, how sad. And then uh, Dave went on to play with Kevin Coyne, Jonathan Kelly's outside. He played with uh, Soft Machine um, spin-offs with Hugh Hopper and all sorts. Yeah, fantastic career. Brilliant. And um, David Sheen, we'll talk about this a bit later. But, yes, um, do. He, he was um, with you in the band Ben, ben yeah. as well, which we come on to a bit later. But before that, I would like to know... Have you ever had any other profession apart from playing music? Uh, oh, God. That you would care my to parents, admit to? Well, especially my father, wanted me to... He saw the computer age coming. Yeah. And he wanted me to go into the computers. And I did I, I did start at so GECs in Frimley. Oh, I know, yeah. And, um, of course, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And um, it was all on punch tape. Yeah, and you were supposed to, you were supposed to write a program uh, on punch tape, and then the computer was in an air conditioned room. Yeah, with these great big uh, discs, and it was uh, how it was things like, have it was changed. Like a, it was like a god, you know. Yeah, and yeah. you had to book the time, and you'd only get half an hour because. And I'd go in. I didn't have a clue what I was doing, 
and then I'll just say, oh, it didn't work, and that, and that would be the end of that. <laughs> so how long did that last? I don't know. It went on for a while, and then uh, that wasn't going well, so I went into the drawing office, as because I had an A-level engineering drawing, right, and, and A-level maths. It was almost... Uh, I was being pushed in that direction. By your father. Yeah. Yeah. And then the crunch came when I, ref I, I refused to go to university. I just had enough of it. Yeah. And, uh, so were you playing music as well at this point? Yeah. Yeah. So in the drawing office, I had to do six months uh, in the workshop on lathes. Uh, right. milling machines which i'd already done at technical school in southall okay uh, working on lathes mm. and um and then i used to take they called me the part-timer because i would never do overtime <laughs> and i used to take off <laughs> every day i could it was just horrific i was always scared <laughs> of getting my fingers chopped off in the machinery oh dear and, what, uh, throwing sickies and things like that or just yeah and then right. i'd uh Sometimes, sometimes I used to clock in and then just disappear and then come back and clock out. <laughs> and there was no one there really to tell me what to do, and I hated that. I hated There's having dedication. to waste time and get yeah. through the day by wasting time. Oh, just, boring. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, went, I was back in the drawing office, uh, and then I realised that it would take years to be qualified as a draftsman. Yeah. But you could, but you could qualify quite quickly doing pcb design okay because then that was before computers came in and took over that role yeah so i very quickly uh got established as a pcb designer and i did mm. that and then i left i left gc and then i went to solatrons in farnborough through an agency so that the money got better and then uh, ended up freelancing in the end working at IBM in Winchester, okay. or just outside Winchester, Hurley. Right, so you, you did that for a, a few years then, a I would imagine. A few years, but I had gigs, uh, and this was before the M3, and mm. I had to drive to Winchester, the other side of Winchester every day. That's quite, quite a trek. A, a run, but uh, I'd be earning about twice as much as people sitting next to me that were yeah. employed. Yeah, because you were uh, freelance. Was freelance, and... Um, but I was having to go to gigs straight after. I had to take yeah. my gear with me and then drive straight. Um, yeah, I remember those days. And it was boring anyway. And then I decided, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing it anymore. So was there, a, was there a specific turning point, or did you gradually decide I've had enough? It what? was gradual. Um, yeah. It was good money, but it's, it's just not. I was, I was more or less disowned by my parents. <laughs> 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 for growing, for being a hippie and growing, <laughs> growing hair and, and stuff like that. But you but still yeah. got your mother to knit you a, a, a oh, sort of beatnik. Oh, that was really early on in the beatnik, <laughs> beatnik era, yeah. The jumper my, down to your knees. My mother came round a bit and she would uh, she would go to the uh, to some gigs. She went to some Nashville teen gigs. We played. Right. Well, she moved down. To, they'd split up and she moved down to Wimborne. And she turned up at the uh, Bournemouth Winter Gardens. Ah, the Winter Gardens. Yeah. yeah, that was a bit of a turning point, wasn't it? The Winter Gardens. I'm jumping the gun a bit, but oh, I just yeah. seem to remember that's how um, the Katmandu thing came it into was fruition. That. It was that, yeah. It was the same same gig, was it? It was that gig, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because um, it was you and Chris Holland. You bumped into Mongo Jerry frontman, yeah, Ray he was Dorset. On they were playing, yeah. Yeah, so you, you got chatting and you thought it would, would be a good idea to... It was Chris that got chatting. I I already knew Ray. Um, yeah, because you were at school with Ray Dorset, we were weren't you? We were at school together, yeah. Yeah. So we, did you do anything? Did you Were you sort of both interested in playing music at the time Yes, you we used him? to take our guitars into school and play them on the bus. And um, Ray Dorset, we used to share the bus from Southall to Hounslow. Yeah, because he lived in Ashford, didn't he? Did he? Uh, I think he. Uh, yeah, I think he I'm lived in Ashford, sure. and uh, strangely enough, now he lives in Dorset. So I so I read. Yeah, Bournemouth way. Yeah, so you joined the band Ben in 1968. You got signed up in 1970 with Vertigo. Yeah. With the Vertigo label, and released your first album in 1971. Yeah, uh, our manager. Um, 
Martin Cole. Yeah. We had a duo, two managers. Uh, they would work together. At, uh, they had a thing called Music Street, and they was based in Ascot. And they used to put on gigs at Bracknell Sports Centre, all the big gigs. So yeah. we used to get a lot of the supports there. And um, they were pushing Ben. And then Martin got together with Richard Branson, and they started Virgin Records. Ah. So I assumed that we would be... That was, that was never going to work. <laughs> no. Virgin. Uh, we thought, well, we're going to be signed with Virgin... Right. But uh, as soon as uh, Mike Oldfield came along with Tubular Bells, yeah. Martin fell out with Richard because he said this wasn't the idea that we set, set out to do. Right. Uh, so Branson went with the money and Martin still had some sort of principles <laughs> being young oh, hippies and, okay. um, and he left. So that's what happened there. And then so the whole thing fell apart and then I got the deal with Phillips. The vertigo thing. Yeah. And that happened through it. Strangely enough, it was another Martin Cole band. And they, because I was had a van to drive around, they said, would you help out with... They went to a big audition um, in, in London somewhere. I can't remember where. And um, I said, yeah, I'll help out. And of course, I was there watching all these bands come on. And yeah. then I approached the guy that was running it. I said, well, I play in a band and we're playing at the Marquee next week, if you're mm. to coming along. And he came to the Marquee and we got signed through that. Just like that? Mm. Wow. Because Verg- um, Vertigo was about alternative bands, wasn't it, really? Yes, it was. And I discovered a lot of really good music through... Mm. Uh, there was a Vertigo compilation called Suck It and See. Yeah, I think I think you. I remember Garrett. You talking to Gary about that? Yeah, and it Ben had, was on the. Ben well, on no, that. that was another one actually. Oh, another right. Vertigo one called Time Machine, oh, which yeah, is a Time three Machine, CD yeah. collection of Vertigo acts, mm. and Ben is on it with a track called The Influence. The, the album's only got four tracks on it, hasn't it? Yes. Yeah, and it's sort of um, sort of jazz rock sort of influence, isn't Progressive it? Progressive jazz rock. It was Pro- called. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a good description. Yeah, a bit of bit of bit proggy, and a bit jazz rocky. It was mainly sax orientated. Yes, as you might have heard. Yeah. Um, I remember one night we we supported Van de Graaff Generator. Right. And we blew them away, honestly. Really. Although I say it myself, yeah. <laughs> but that's all down to Pete. Pete. Uh, Pete Davy. Pete Davy. He used yeah. to play tenor. Yeah. With an octave dropper on. Oh. Um, which had just come out, Gibson Maestro, right? Ob- octave dropper, mm. and then he used to play a soprano with an octave dropper on, uh, an alto with an octave dropper. So on. is that like an I- electronic device? Yeah, and he used to play them all together as well, all three <laughs> at once. It was a huge sound. Wow! And then, we but had- not the flute as well. I take it and flute. Say. <laughs> he used to do flute and alto, tenor and things, all with these octave droppers on. Wow. And then guitar, bass and drums as well. And that was Dave Sheen, yeah. God. So that was Ben. So it was, it was one album. It's a bit of a rarity. It does fetch quite a high price, apparently. That yeah. Album. It's quite hard to get hold of. Although there is the full, full thing on YouTube, if anyone's interested. It's in, all on YouTube, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was having a listen. I like it, actually. It's good. Uh... The influence... Um, we didn't write that. We said, well, we, ha- we haven't written this. And they uh, persuaded us to split it into all these different sections. Just credit the, the theme tune to uh, Mike Garrick. Right. It's a, a Garrick's song. Oh, okay. And then they, the rest of it they credited to us. It wasn't our idea at all. Oh. But we were forced into that. We just wanted to credit it to Michael Garrick. So it was like a, the rest of it was like a variation on yeah, the theme, was all, was it? Um, uh, yeah, it was all, yeah. okay. That's how they did it. So then it all sort of um, folded, we, like one album we, and... Well, we signed a deal for five years. Okay. Two albums a year. But so um, after the first album, mm. we we discovered, well, we found out that they were, weren't doing a thing for us. Uh, where there was no tours, nothing, uh, we decided to uh, just lay low. Yeah, that's a shame because, you know, being a bit of a pioneering label, yeah. you'd, you'd think they would have um, sort of ploughed a bit of money They into weren't you. looking after us at all and we weren't yeah. certainly weren't getting any, <laughs> any money. Oh, oh that's a which shame. Which nobody did in those days. Yeah, yeah, because they had, um, I think they had the Edgar Winter Band and Rod Stewart, uh, a German band called Atlantis all signed up. 
Yeah, I've got the Atlantis album, yeah. That's good, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Living at the end of time, that's fantastic, yeah. yeah. I couldn't believe that was a female singer when I discovered, when I found out. Yeah. It was yeah. a female singer, but, you know, it sounds like a, a, a sort of um, strong sort of rock, gravelly male And they had Ramses as well on Vertigo. Yes. Which oh, was, Ramses, yeah. Which was 10cc before they became 10cc. Yes. Yes. I saw a program recently on on 10cc. Yeah, and uh, they started Strawberry they were, Studios. Wasn't Strawberry it? Studios. They were just yeah. technicians, really. That's right. Musicians yeah. as well, and they did an album for Neil Sedaka. Yeah, they did. Unbelievable. And then it just led on to their on to 10cc. Yeah, and yeah. I've I've heard Neil Sedaka being interviewed, and he said he loved it. He said it was you know great experience. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that must have been great. 10cc. They played all the backing on that Ramses. That's right. Yeah. Album, didn't they? Yeah. They, they were basically the band. Yes. Unofficially. Yes. But it was their studio, so they thought, oh, we, we'll play on it and produce it and engineer it and everything. And um, they got that amazing cover that folds out, which yeah. is a great idea. Apparently, Ra Ramses. I can't remember the, the name of the actual guy, but um, I can't either. He was a plasterer or something before he. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And there was a girl singer in that as well, I think. Was there? I think so. Yeah, well, he, he's on this compilation as well called Time Machine. Right. Which is quite interesting. There's some really obscure bands on there. But, uh, yeah, going back to you. Um, so, okay. yeah, that album was released in 1971, but then the deal sort of folded. But then in 1975, you joined the Nashville Teens. Yes. Which... The, the band that's been going in various guises since the the sort of mid 60s really yeah after or, after ben <coughs> we used to play quite a lot with pato yeah that were on vertigo right and we got on great with them and mm. and pete was would, 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 was playing with them as well when we i think pete went on to play with them oh did he on the monkey's bum album <laughs> <laughs> nice uh, we, were, we were good good, good friends yeah um but i did i did get a band together after ben and we shot off to germany yeah um this is with my wife before we were married ah. and we went off and we and uh, for quite a few years we we based ourselves in uh, antwerp uh, what were they called junior pilots we were called right and was it a similar kind of music it or? was blues Okay. Um, it started off, we had to play covers. Yeah. But they all ended up sounding like blues. Because <laughs> Dave and I and Tony, this was the guitar player I mentioned earlier. Yeah. We all, that's how we started playing in blues bands around our parents, or Dave's parents used to drive us to gigs and stuff. <laughs> they were the roadies. Yes. <laughs> and when I came, we came back... Tony never came back. He'd never been abroad and uh, he loved Belgium, uh, especially Antwerp. And uh, he stayed. He never came back. He loved it. Really? He, yeah. But you decided at some point you'd we had came, enough. We used to come back. Yeah. Come back for Christmas and stuff. Uh, and that led on to... Uh, I joined a band called Snow Leopard. Right. That's a good name. Yeah, before Snow Patrol and all that. <laughs> Snow uh. Leopard. And then we used to do supports at... Looked after by the same guys. Yeah. Martin Cole, Andy Kildare. And we used to do the supports at the Bratnell Sports Centre. Right. And Ben Ben would do the support for for Quo. Uh. I mean, you couldn't imagine... <laughs> <laughs> but you, yeah, you couldn't imagine two you more different imagine, you imagine it. styles, could you, no. really? And um, <clears throat> we, I, I guess, I have to admit, we were a little bit snobby, being a bit jazzers. Right, yeah. Uh, playing, with, playing with Quo. But honestly, that gig changed my attitude. Mm. I loved Quo, the, the, yeah. the energy, and the, it was a mad night. Yeah, so you, but you've been sort of a blues influence. Yes. What did you think of the the Ben sort of music? Were you, did you did you get into it or? Yes. Yeah. We used to um, we used to rehearse every yeah. week, mm. and changes would be made every week, and right. those changes would come into immediate effect for the next gig, okay. and that's how it worked. And I loved that way of working. Right. So was this. Before the album was recorded, it was yeah. So it sort of evolved. It over evolved. Time. Con it was continued. We had the second album written, 
but right. we never got around to uh, we fell out with uh, oh that's a shame yeah so it never even got recorded no mm. and that was a that was a masterpiece uh, we learned it it was all uh, scored and everything well it's not too late you have to dig out the, <laughs> dig out the scores yeah but I, I might be the only surviving member i'm not sure about jerry the guitarist i haven't uh, oh so david sheen's no longer with us he passed last year so that's my best schoolmate oh no that's yeah yeah so there was jerry reed jerry Peter reed Davey, i don't know about jerry yeah. I tried to look him up on Facebook, but no, he's not. I can't find anything about him. But strangely enough, Gary and I, Dave moved down to uh, Devon. Yeah. And um, he played. He was playing a gig in Shel Shelford, Shelton, Shelford, uh, and he had his own band, Dave Sheen Trio. Right. And Gary and I were down that way, playing yeah. around Tall Bay and stuff. And we went to see him. That's the last time we saw him about six years ago. Oh, so at no. least I got, I used to see him on other occasions as well when we were down yeah. that way. Uh, um, so we did get to see him. Gary was very impressed. Yeah. Uh, amazing drummer. And he had um, just a bass player and keyboard player. Right. Awesome. And what kind of style was he playing then? It's jazz, it was just jazz. Still, yeah, still yeah, improvised, jazz. Improvised jazz, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. And a nice crowd in there, all jazz freaks. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. So you were in Nashville Teens from for nearly ten years. It was ten years. years, yeah. Yeah. So um, how how did that come about? The that came about through Snow Leopard. Um, as Rob Pusey was the drummer, and uh, we both joined uh, the Nashville. Te I, it came about through us working with uh, Kilburn and the High Roads um, with the Injury. Yes. So we used to do the gigs with Dave Robinson. Yeah. And then we did a gig at Kingston Poly doing the support. And they were using our gear. And it failed when they came on. <laughs> and I never saw the injury again. <laughs> you probably thought you sabotaged it. And also, uh, it, they took off immediately. <laughs> so one minute we're there and the next minute we're gone. <laughs> and it took off with uh, what were they called again? The, the blockheads. Uh, the blockheads. Yeah. Yeah. It changed from the Kilburn and the high race to the blockheads, mm. and then took off with Chaz Chaz Jankel. Yeah, uh, yeah, and they were massive, weren't they? I've I've watched the film about it, and it's nothing like what happened. Really? <laughs> Chaz Jankel wasn't there at all when when we were working with it. He joined a bit later, but they make out Chaz was there oh. right from quite early on. So you know the true story. Yeah. You'll have to. You see, when you write your book, you'll have to put in the, the real <laughs> version of yeah. events. <laughs> oh, that's right. Ray, Ray Phillips, the original singer, yeah, and the only one left. Uh, he was at that gig, the injury. All oh, right. And he saw us play the support. Yeah. And he took us, took me and the drummer on into the Nashville teens. Ah, oh, right. So that's how it came and about. And it might have been the guitarist as well, uh, yeah. Ian. Um, and that's how that, that came about. Yeah, because Nashville Teens, it may have been before uh, before you joined them. They were a sort of backing band, weren't they, in America? They backed some of the... They did Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah, Jerry Lee Lewis. There's an album of um, Jerry Lee Lewis with the Nashville Teens ah. live in Hamburg. Live in Hamburg. Yeah. I was listening to a live album of his on uh, Spotify the other day. I don't know whether it was that one or not. It, it was meant to be a bit been. of a class classic, Jerry Lee Lewis. Yes. So that may well have been the one. I think it might have been. Yeah. It was good. It was good. He used to insist on the Nashville Teens being the backing band when he came over. Yeah. For Europe and, yeah. and here, yeah. And they're still going strong, aren't they, the Nashville teens? Yeah, Ray's 83 now. Is he really? Yeah. Wow. Talking about that, we... Yeah. Um, when I joined, I think Ray was in his 40s. Yeah. And I was in my 30s. Yeah. And we took on a guitar player in his 20s. And uh, the drummer was a teenager. It was like a nice set. <laughs> Across the generations. And I don't, I don't remember anyone doing that. No oh. one had done that. I'm sure everyone used to stick to their own kind of age group. Yeah. Used to see it all the time, age this, you know, mm. and I'm sure. And I, and Ray was doubtful about uh, the drummer. 
I said, no, it'd be great. Yeah. Having a young drummer with hungry and full of energy. Full of energy, yeah. Uh, it was great. And he's still yeah. with them now. So he's wow. the longest serving <laughs> non-original member. It's a good job you spoke up for him. And also, when I left, um, Colin, pa Colin Pattenden joined. Yep. And he's still there as well. Yeah. They're still been, going strong, still busy. And I left in 1983, late 83 or 4. Yeah. And he, they're still there now. So did you go off to, did you get another offer or you? Yeah, Peter Green. Ah, so that's And the guitar, when... we split. Uh, Peter, the guitar player, left as well. We both right. left. Ah, so this is a good point to go on to the uh, Katmandu project. Yeah. With Peter Green. As you said earlier, it was through Chris Holland. Yeah, at, at that gig in uh, Winter, uh, in Gardens, Winter Gardens in, in Bournemouth. Bournemouth. Yeah. Yeah, so that was... Um, that was quite an interesting turn of events. Um, it was supposed to be, a, it was an attempt at forming a, a super group. Right. Because we had Vincent Crane. Ex Atomic Rooster. Atomic Rooster and Arthur keyboards. Brown, Crazy World of Arthur Brown. Yeah, yeah, he came And I fire, loved, didn't he? I loved that band. I loved Arthur Brown. And um, there was no guitar in that band, so it was oh. all done on the Hammond. Right. And I loved Hammond. He's the best, he's the best Hammond player. And I do love Graham Bond. Yeah. But um, Vincent Crane and then Ray Dorset from Mungo Jerry, obviously. Yeah. The drummer had already been playing with Peter. And this uh, percussionist. Jeff Whitaker. Jeff Whitaker. Yeah. Yeah. Who thought he was running the, the show, really. Did he? Well, there was a period when... Uh, and it was usually the drummer, strange enough, that would carry a briefcase, a black case. <laughs> I don't what? know if you've come across that before. With his drumsticks in? Or it was a, it was a, it was a phase. Lunch? It was a phase that they right. were doing, the, looking after the business side of things. Anyway, mm. um, we were in the studio and they were recording everything we did. Yeah. And, he, and then Jeff came in and said, uh, he said, I've lost my case. Is, and no one was interested. We, we, we just carried on playing. And he got, and he saw there was a, a mic that was live. Yeah. And he got hold of the mic and started rapping it. He said, "I was in Richmond. I, I uh, saw my case. You'll hear it on the album." I've heard it. Yeah. I did hear it. Yeah. yeah. The case. It's if called, you listen to it carefully, it's the last track, isn't it? It's called yeah, the case. The case. And if you listen to it carefully. He's actually threatening threatening us, really. He said, "I spoke I spoke to my lawyer, and you, you I know you you can have your fun, you know." And uh, <laughs> and they put it on the album. Yeah. Not only that, but they called it a case for case the blues. <laughs> and I'm sure Peter must have instigated that. Oh, that is that is classic. That but is. But if you yeah. listen to it, it's very laid back. I just I I assume that was um, Ray Dorset on the on the vocals. Most of it. Uh. Um, there's an interesting track with Vincent. Um, oh, what the instrumental Crane's Train Boogie. Yeah, with P Peter, P Peter's playing drums on that. Is he? Yeah, brushes. Ah, he's great. Yeah, there's a bit of knowledge. Yeah, so that was the the one instrumental on the album. There's also one. Because it, it's all sort of very blues orientated, but then you've got Sweet Sixteen, which it's horrible. <laughs> do you not like that one? No. It takes on this funky sort of style, doesn't it? With it's horrible. Electric um, piano and Vincent wanted a track on the album. Yeah. Fair enough. And he said he said to me that he wanted a different bass player because I'm not funky. I'm not oh. funk. I'm not really funky. Um, I thought, I thought you did a good good job on that track. <laughs> um, and I said, fine. And then a couple of weeks went by and then I got a phone call saying, can you come in and repair a track? I said, yeah, I'll come in. So I went in and they played the track and I said, uh, I said, well, I'll give it a go. But the, the drums are a little bit out anyway. Yeah. The time is a little bit out. But I'll, Yeah, because it was I'll, all virtually live, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I said, I'll give it a go if you want, but yeah. it's a little bit dodgy anyway. And then they immediately agreed with me and left it. Yeah. But accidentally on purpose, let it run into Vincent's track. 
Yeah. Where he had this other bass player on. And, and they said, oh, uh, and they mixed it down to just the bass. Yeah. And they said, well, we're not happy with that. While you're here, Len, <laughs> can you put the bass on? We want you after all. Which I did. I, re- I reckon that must have been Peter mm. to put me back on the whole, oh. the whole album. Yeah. yeah. I think. Well, it makes sense. It does. Yeah. It's a horrible track. I hate it. Sorry, uh, Vincent. Well, I quite liked it personally. <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't really blend in with it the, the, the no. mood of the album, does it? That's the problem. My favourite track is uh, Who's That Knocking? Yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was a jam. Uh, only played once. Yep. Never before or since. And that to me was totally unique. The fact that they just recorded what we played and that was a warm-up jam. They added on a bit of harp. Yeah. And, and they added on pieces. Was that you? I yeah. did notice a bit of harp in the background. No, it wasn't me. Oh, it wasn't you? That would be Peter. Yeah. I'm guessing it would be Peter because Ray plays a bit as well. Right. Um, and I just love the swampy feel on it. Yeah. It but, has got a certain atmosphere. I mean, it's, it's it's got a very sort of casual sort of atmosphere, the whole album. The whole album, because the first track is literally... Is it Dust My Broom? Yeah. It's it like just you, drifts in. Yeah, like you're just setting up and it, we here we go. We just start playing it and yeah. then Jeff has to talk Peter into doing it. Yeah, it's you almost like going, the first first song in a pub gig, you know. Yeah, it's sort of, and then Pete, you can hear Peter saying, uh, you can hear Peter saying, oh, well, let's do that other one that he's singing first. Well, that's right. He says, do you, he know, says, do you know any... any etid- and then Jeff says... Uh, because we're already playing it, aren't we? Dust yeah, my broom. Yeah. And then he kind of reluctantly starts singing it. Mm. So it kind of shambles in. Yeah. So it's very re- relaxed. And then there's that track about blowing. Is it blowing my blowing trouble, my troubles away? Yeah. Blowing my troubles away. Yeah. That's got that's, gr- that's, that's got, Ray Dorset, isn't it? On that's Ray Dorset singing. Yeah. Great voice. Great voice. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it, it's like he's he's been accused of the murder. Yeah. Of his... These were not. Uh, these were songs that he, he, he had already. They right. weren't. And I think we ran through them once. Yeah. He would say, it's, these are the chords, and yeah. we would just do it straight away, first take. Mm. That's how, how it all happened. The Who's That Knocking? Yeah. I remember, I'm only playing E. <laughs> <laughs> Different octaves of E and sort of messing about. Yeah. And it just kept going. I'm sort of p- pumping and plodding. And then... I, was, I remember thinking, where's this going to go and mm. who's going to make a move? Because it has to change. Yeah. And I think I made the move. Right. I did a kind of strange riff. Yeah. And it went into another. And the only way I can describe it is at the beginning, it's going like a train like that. Yeah. And when I do a, ba- a bass, it goes do 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 And yeah. then it goes... And then the whole thing starts swaying from side to side. That's the only way I can... Right. I'm so, thinking that so that was just a spontaneous... Yeah, very... You, yeah. you thought, oh, this is getting a bit... And then it went... We need, need it started like it. that, and then it yeah. went like that. And I thought, wow, they followed me yeah. into that. So that. That was like a magical moment. And I'm sure... Um, and then years later, I was playing in this, in this jazz band as a guitarist. Yeah. Uh, I just saw an ad in Windsor... In the music shop, guitarist yeah. needed for this jazz band. Right. And I thought, well, I'll give it a go. And uh, could have knocked me down with a feather when I got the gig. Because I didn't know, I, I didn't know anything. <laughs> I didn't. And we went, we did the first gig and I was thinking, oh, I hope there's no musicians in the audience. <laughs> and I just blagged it all the way through. <laughs> I just blagged it all the way through. But I soon kind of knocked something together. Yeah. Out of, out of something. And strangely enough, I joined Spin Out. UK as a guitarist, not a bass player. Did you? Gary was playing bass. So oh. somehow yeah. it's gone back. Yeah, so it's gone round. It's gone around. And Gary I, I, wasn't even a bass player originally, was he? He was a, well, he start, started off as a drummer. That was in, yeah, up in Chester. Years ago. Um, yeah. But I'd, I've just realised I said that Crane's Train Boogie was the only instrumental, but actually there is another one, Zulu Gone West, isn't there? Which is the sort of African-sounding one. Yeah, that was Jeff Whittaker kind of doing his thing. Oh, was it? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's quite novel. It's quite uh, quite enjoyable. It's a good track. Yeah. Yeah, again, that's that's a bit 
sort of off kilter from the rest of the album isn't it really it is they had to knock an album up from yeah. what they had yeah apparently there's uh, i heard from ray dorsey a few years later that there was enough material for another album oh right so you didn't uh, only record the nine I, tracks I, I think i think peter had uh it wasn't wasn't up for that Oh, that's a shame. Yeah, yeah, because he doesn't really he feature what well, his guitar playing doesn't really feature heavily, does it? Uh, you know, like there's solos. some interest. There's some interesting uh, moments. Hmm. Uh, there's one I can't remember which track it is, but it comes to the solo yeah. where Peter's playing it, and he and he fluffs it, and you can hear Ray Dorsett saying, "Yeah, yeah, play it again, play it again," and he and he plays it again, <laughs> gets it right, I think. <laughs> but although it's not what it used to be like in Fleetwood Mac, um, yeah. it's still got an amazing feel to it. Yeah. But there was one sound he was making. I can't describe it. It was very distorted. And I think it's featured in the Who's That Knocking? Right. Which he must have put on afterwards. And it's really distorted. And I was in on the, I was at the mix and I said, let's have more of that. Yeah. Because I heard it first on the, when I was at, round at peter's and uh we were playing records and things and I, I said can i put this album it was in in the skies right and i heard the sound on there mm. it was this distorted uh i said that's i said what is that sound he said that's me on guitar i said that is awesome and he, and it's on that who's that, who's knocking, that knocking track but it's not loud enough it's right. not up, up in the mix enough yeah. they didn't take they didn't take any notice of what i said so was that that was recorded in Ray Dorset's studio, wasn't it? Was, it yeah. Satellite studio. Yes. Yeah. Well, Peter wanted to keep the band together. Right. But Vincent got offered loads of money to go with Dex's Midnight Runners. Ah. I think they offered him £200 a day just to rehearse. Wow. Yeah, that's hard to turn down, And isn't it? Um, the last thing he said to me was, <laughs> playing Come On Eileen's going to do my head in. He said that. <laughs> And I remember saying, well, why do it then? Why mm. do it? But there you go. The money. That's what he said. Yeah. And he committed suicide in the end. But he was yes. manic. He was a bit of a bipolar. Was you know. he? Yeah. But he was great. He was great. Yeah. I mean, Atomic Rooster were a great band. Fantastic. Yeah. Loved it. Devil's Answer. Yeah. Tomorrow Night. It was great. great. It was great. Great rock tracks. Both got and into then, the charts. And then Ray disappeared off to south africa with mungo jerry right and uh we ended up the drummer stayed on and we ended up in rehearsal situation at ginger baker's studio in action oh right and there was a uh, a different guitar player and a different keyboard player and uh, i wasn't getting on with him <laughs> it wasn't happening because it was the method of rehearsing that i couldn't because if, if we played something and I didn't get it right, they would say play it again. Right. And um, so I was. They wanted me to play. Oh well. Yeah. With the bass line the same as the guitar. Yeah. And I'm not sure that was c correct. Mm. So I was trying to play it. And um, oh, it's not right. Play it again. And in the end, I said, because uh, we were supposed to go to Japan, and I said. It's, this isn't working. I said, I'll know it. I said, if we go to Japan, I'll, ha I'll, 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 I'll have it. And yeah. in desperation, I went up to Peter and said, uh, can you help me out, Pete, Peter, on this? And, he's, uh, and he just said to me, it's a personal technique, which yeah. meant he wasn't expecting me to play it. No. And, um, and then I got a phone call. I was out. And then I think Peter rang a couple of weeks later. <laughs> And asked me if I'd left. Oh. I said, no, Peter, I got kicked out of your band. Oh, no. Yeah. So who actually threw you out then? I'm not sure, but uh, Margaret Bennett, his lawyer, she used to phone me and try and get me to influence Peter, which I wasn't happy about. And she said, can you ask Peter about going to Japan? Because they want yeah. the band in Japan. And I said, well, I can ask him, but <laughs> I'm not sure whether... He'll answer me, right. even. So I did ask him. I said, oh, Margaret Bennett phoned me and asked about going to Japan. 
And this was typical of Peter. He said to me, who's Margaret Bennett? <laughs> Which didn't mean he didn't know who it was. It meant that he didn't, he didn't... Um, so that value her, her opinion? Or? No, he didn't recognise her as, as, as his lawyer. Right. She would have been set up by his family, I'm oh, guessing. Oh, right, okay, yeah. He didn't, uh, no, he didn't like that at all. And at the time... They were providing Peter with a little house in Richmond yeah, and, uh, and enough money to go and get breakfast and they had a cleaner in as well yeah, and um, 20 pounds a day. And I did try and tackle uh, the lawyers about it, but you know, it wasn't going to, oh, mm. if, if we give him any more money, you're just going to spend it on drugs. That was the excuse. That was oh. the excuse for not. So he was, so do you think he never actually came off the drugs from the time he, he left Fleetwood Mac? Because um, uh, he wasn't doing anything. No? He wasn't doing anything, no. He wasn't? No. Not, so they, not, they were just trying to yeah. basically control him? Yes. Yeah. Because there must be millions coming in. Yeah. That's all I'd better say on that. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Yeah. So, w was it an enjoyable experience? Um, oh God! Recording yeah, that album. It. Yeah, I um, best thing I did really. Loved it. Yeah. Yeah. It was the fact that I was playing with Peter and with Vincent. Yeah. Yeah. Just, that's because uh, I'd always looked up to them. Favorite Hammond player. Yeah. Great um, bunch of musicians. Like a legendary a favorite guitarist. guitarist. Yeah. Uh, Hendrix brilliant. would be kind of up there. Yeah. Number one in a way because yeah. i saw him and uh i suppose his influence uh was bb king wasn't it uh peter green yeah i guess i've recently got into jesse uh ed davis yeah i've done if you've heard of him no i haven't uh it's an american guy he was an indian red indian descent and uh so it's very unusual for someone of that of that group to start playing guitar yeah. and he was playing with taj mahal Right, yeah. And Clapton, all the English, everyone was influenced by him. Wow. Um, and they got the gig with the Rolling Stones Circus. Yeah, Rock um, and Roll cir Circus. Yeah, Taj Mahal are on, on there. Yeah. And um, he, he is amazing. Uh, it's only a Telecaster, no pedals, just straight into the amp. And... Uh, he actually does fluff a little bit on the solo. Yeah. But he makes up for it the way he finishes the solo. Right. I think. Uh, awesome tech. Sort of almost a steel guitar sort of sound on oh, parts. I'll have to look him up. Yeah, he's great. He must he's be great. on YouTube. And he was always very, very stoned. You can see, there's a few pictures of him and you can, you can see it. Like Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, he didn't last long. He was, you know, he was, he was mm. onto the heroin and uh, died quite early on. But he influenced Clapton. He, when he came over to the UK, Clapton said, come and stay with me. Yeah. I mean, there were so many drugs around, weren't there, in those days? I mean, Eric Clapton, Jimi yeah. Hendrix. Yeah. Peter Green. Sure. So now you're with Spin Out UK. Yep. Been with them for a while, with Gary Roberts. Um, you're pretty busy at the moment with them? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're, we're playing the Dublin Castle in Camden. Yeah. And that's about... Uh, Gary's trying to get the festival in Bournemouth sorted out. Right. Uh, apart from that, I don't think we've got much on. It's he needs been, to put in for the Wayfest. It's been a hard time, hasn't it, the last couple of years? It has been difficult, yeah. Um, it's been very difficult for live bands. I mean, your main source of income well, we, was just... We played like, down... Uh, in fact, we've only played twice with the full lineup with Will. Really? The first one was, uh, might have been in between lockdowns, and there was no rehearsal, which mm. I love, you know. <laughs> yeah, I you like living on the edge. I like to be on the edge. Yeah. And, uh, and Will said, well, we haven't played for, <laughs> we haven't played for about a year here. Uh, what could possibly go wrong, you know? <laughs> but I thought it was great, the way yeah. you can just turn it on. I love it. I love yeah. that. Turn it on, you know. That's what it's all about, isn't and it? And that's what the Nashville Teens could do. Because mm. I don't know if you've seen that 1983 live at the Nags Head. No, I've not seen that's that. That's awesome. No. Well, what happened was... Uh, the 19... Nags Head in... High Wycombe. 
Oh, High Wycombe. It's a okay. great gig where the yeah. Sex Pistols and the yeah. Rolling Stones used to play there. Right. Everyone had played there. Mm. It was run by Ron Watts, and he used to do the 100 Club on a Tuesday night as well. Yeah. And get blues, uh, blues artists over from America. And um, we got a live, we got a recording studio, mobile recording studio. Right. To, to record the gig for a record release. Yeah. And... Um, but there was a camera running as well, yeah. which was forgotten about. Ah. 35 years later, nine, uh, 2018, yeah. they found it. Who discovered it? I think it was Andy Kildare. Right. He, was, he looked after Ben with Martin Cole, but he also started looking after the National Teens yeah. a bit as well. And he found it. They played through it. They found three original songs that hadn't been published and there was a deal there, and yeah. did a deal with Secret Records. Right. And it came out, uh, it's the whole night. Mm. Just one camera, no editing, and it starts off with tuning up. Because we didn't have tuners in those days, it was tuning up. No, it was all up. done by ear. It was just... all just tuning up, and yeah. then I can remember the guitarist Pete saying, oh, we never really get it right. Mm. And then Ray, Ray puts a bit of chewing gum in, has a, in and then... <laughs> And then we start off with one of the original songs, which yeah. is a kind of a punky, a punk influenced song, right. original. And it kicks off and you think, how can we keep that up? That, the, <laughs> the way it's turned yeah. on. And uh, it does. And if you watch the whole show. Yeah. And you keep wow. up that, that level for the whole of the gig. And it just goes into that and it goes rock and roll and it does those covers. It, I think we do... And all the harmonies are spot on. Wow. A masterclass in live performance. It's fantastic. Yeah. And I'd, I'd, forgot, I'd, ha I'd forgotten about those days. And that's on YouTube, is it? Some of it is. Ah. At first, they put it all on audio on YouTube. Mm. Right. Secret Records put it on. And then they started putting a few of the clips on from the, from the DVD. Yeah. So you, you can catch some of it. Uh, I think they've put on... Uh, Born to be Wild, right? And I think they put on Tobacco Road as well. The one to listen to is the the last one, the encore, the last encore, and we've run out in virtually run out of stuff mm. to play. And we did, uh, I think we did. Oh, we did Move It, the old Cliff Richard song. Yeah, yeah. And um, because it wasn't our best thing, we just put more into it, and and it's awesome. And the crowd, it, it was the crowd. Uh, I'll have There's to a watch lot. that. You've got to watch it. They should have released it. As oh, a it is released. What, as a, as an, an audio, like album. It's, it, it's released, uh, you can get it on eBay for about eight quid. Really? You get the two audios and the, and the, whole, of the, uh, the whole of the gig oh, on DVD. Right. And it is amazing. And Ron Watts, uh, he's, he's gone now as well. But it's rare footage of Ron Watts. He comes out and says... Uh, Let's hear it for the national teams. Can't do any more. Uh, <laughs> licensing laws aren't going to permit. And no one's having it. They're not having it. And, um, and, and, and we do come on and play more, yeah. It's amazing how a band can survive for that many years. Yeah. And still be out there, you know, still going strong. Well, the interesting thing is, literally a year before that, we had a deal to go out and record in Denmark and the album was going to be released in, in uh, Scandinavia. Yeah. And we had to do a few gigs for them. Uh, the deal was uh, we did this album. They would give us the master to, to bring back and do with what we want, yeah. wanted and do a few gigs. And um, if you listen to that, it's nothing like it. It's like we're completely lost. It's... Uh, it really does sound like we really are lost and we mm. don't know what we're doing. It sounds... We well, did, we did change. We changed drummer. Do you we think changed. that was something to do with it? I think it might have been. Because it was like when, when uh, Keith Moon died, they struggled to find... In fact, I don't think they ever found a... Well, you wouldn't, would you? I mean, he was awesome. He uh, was awesome. So, like, like Mitch Mitchell. They could have yeah. maybe had Mitch Mitchell. yeah. I mean, he was just unique. Nobody else could copy that style, really, no. could they? Although they got Zach. He was a pretty good replacement. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they got Zach. Well, uh, Len, we could talk all night. I know. I mean, we've gone well over the hour. 
Okay, so well you can over. edit some dodgy bits out. Edit some dodgy bits. I've got plenty of material. Some libel stuff. <laughs> edit yeah, out. all the stuff that might get me sued, yeah, which, exactly. which I don't want. But um, yeah, I've got to say thank you very much for your time. That's great. It's much yeah, appreciated. It's I've loved talking to Fire's you. Fire's nearly gone out. Fire's nearly gone out. <sighs> so yeah, can I just say thanks very much for yeah, coming Yeah, thanks for on. coming down. It was great. Uh, we need another cup of tea, I think. We'll do a beer. <laughs> Definitely. Well, I had a great evening with Len and ended up with over two hours of material which I had to edit down uh, just to the best bits so who knows maybe there'll be a part two one day. I hope you enjoyed listening to this week's edition and if you did please rate, review and come back soon for another episode of the Rockface podcast. <laughs>